Hello everyone! It's been a while since we last saw each other, I hope you're doing well. Last time, after changing the engine architecture and switching to a pre-make build system, we can finally start working on features, right? Yes! Today we will start working on terrain. And without further ado, let us begin. Most of you probably already know what terrain is. That's because you've seen terrain in real life. Terrain is flats, hills, valleys, forests, rivers, rocks, bushes. It's the ground humans live on top of. It is important to realize that while game engines are tools to create games, most 3D engine features are an attempt to simulate reality, be it lighting or movement or anything. Terrain is a great example of this. This is a feature basically all open world games use in some form, having a well-implemented terrain will make it very easy to create realistic worlds. In video game development, there are a few types of terrain, so let's make it clear what I have in mind right now. Specifically, we will start on something known as height map terrain. This is the most popular type of terrain you will see in open world video games. Height map terrain is essentially a plane that has a bunch of points that can be raised up and down, allowing us to create hills, valleys, riverbeds and paths. Terrains may also feature randomized or custom object placement to place forests, grass and other foliage. It may have dynamic textures based on height, steepness and other variables. It is a pretty complex and versatile feature. Given this complexity, I definitely won't be able to implement it in one video, so you might be wondering what goals I have set for myself this time. For starters, I think of creating a basic height map plane. It would be enough for it to accept a 2D noise array, also known as a matrix, resulting in a plane that resembles small hills. Time to start making programming gains! I say that, but the programming for this video did not start with me implementing terrain, and I basically ended up rewriting the hard-coded component array architecture into an actual archetype-based entity component system. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, consider watching the basic entity component system video I made a while back. It took me around a month to rewrite it, and I won't go into much detail about these changes in this video. I did these changes because it would be very hard for me to work on new features if I had to spaghetti everything on top of the current hard-coded component vector architecture. I will make a detailed video about the architecture since there is a lot of stuff going on in the new code. But this time, let's stick to terrain only. So how is rendering terrain different from rendering cubes or spheres for example? Why am I making such a big deal out of this feature? Just create a flat plane and raise some points up and down you might think. And you would be correct. This is all we need to do, but it is not that simple. To understand the difference, let's look into how our geometry is currently rendered. Since we use instance rendering, we generate and store information on what each geometry is in memory. We store vertex position, normal, UV coordinates for each vertex. When we want to draw, let's say a cube, to the GPU we say we are drawing a cube and then send the world transformation matrix for each cube we want to draw. World transformation matrix tells the GPU where to draw it, what is its rotation, and which direction it is stretched. Ok, so why can't we do the same thing with terrain? Well, it's because I'm not powerful enough, because you haven't subscribed yet. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> so why can't we do the same thing with terrain? Let's try it. Say we store a flat terrain at the start for the instance renderer. Using the world transformation matrix, we can also say where the terrain is, how it is rotated, and how stretched it is and I think you might start to understand where the issue is. There is one key difference between rendering cubes and terrain. We want the hills and valleys, we want to change the shape of the initially stored plane, not just stretch it. Cubes and spheres can contract and expand, but we can't make a cube into a sphere, because primitive shapes must follow specific rules. A cube must have 90 degree angles between edges for example. If we were to deform it, it could no longer be called a cube. And this is the fundamental difference. With terrain, we want to be able to deform a flat plane using the already placed vertices. Simply said, terrain is a plane of points whose x and y are never changing, but we are able to control the height of each point. The first thing we could try here is for each vertex, instead of sending position, normal and the v coordinates of the shader, we can also add a height value. This is not the most simple method and I will later show you why. 
but it reveals some interesting things about how the GPU is rendering things. If we have geometries that use one vertex layout, let's say position, normal and UV, and other geometries like our terrain that have something extra, like heights, we cannot really use the same shader, at least in an efficient manner. Why is that? Our application has a variable called device. This is a virtual representation of our graphics device. Yes, that big, constantly sagging thing on your computer. And surprisingly, that thing works in very primitive ways. We can just say that some of our geometry has a height and some of it doesn't. Call a render function on the device variable to render everything. That's because at one specific time, a GPU can only use one shader. Pretty unexpected, right? We mount the shader and tell the GPU what layout the shader is using. Any data that you now bind to the vertex buffer is understood one and only one way, by the layout you provide. So if you happen to accidentally send some data that does not match this layout, let's say you would not get the result you wanted. When you want to render using different layouts, you render one type of geometry, switch the shader, render another type of geometry, and so on. We do the switching each frame. Pretty cool! Anyway, I implemented the shader switching and created a new vertex layout that has a height attached to it. Created a 2D array of random heights, wrote a new shader that uses these heights, and the result I got is this. You might be thinking, hmm, this does not look quite right. It looks like it's not flat, which is great, but it also looks like it's flat at the same time. The keyword here is normals. We may have set the height of each vertex to something different, but lighting is determined by which direction the triangles of the geometry are facing, and we haven't changed that from the flat plane. So what now? Will we have to add normals into the layout as well? No. There actually exists a solution that is much more simple and will not require using a new vertex layout at all. In fact, we could remove normal and height data from the vertex layout completely and use the same technique to pass both vertex height and normal to the shader. Textures! Yep, we are going to use textures to determine the height and the orientation of each point on the terrain. If you haven't worked much with shaders just like me, you might be wondering how the hell will I use textures to do this? Don't worry, it's actually very simple. You might be familiar with noise maps, these images that have a bunch of white, grey and black pixels. GPUs are very good at doing one thing, and that thing is working with textures. It's so good in fact, that you can easily sample individual pixels on an image. Let's say that our terrain has a minimum height of minus 10 and a maximum height of 10. If our image has a pixel that is completely black, then the height of that vertex will be minus 10. And if the pixel is completely white, then the height is 10. This will require some additional things, like a texture sampler that defines how the textures are understood by the shader. We will also need to actually bind the textures on the CPU side, but in general this is a lot more simple to do, since most of the job is done by the free image library that loads the images and the direct X library that converts the images to something that can be understood by the shaders. All of this info can be easily found online because of how popular texture sampling is. Okay, perfect. By sampling the pixels in the vertex shader, we have achieved the exact same result as before. Now, how would we solve the problem with normals? We are going to use a thing you have likely heard of before. A normal map. A normal map is also a texture, but instead of heights, it stores the information of the direction the surface is facing. The GPU can use that information to correctly calculate lighting. This texture won't be black and white, but instead will be colored, where each color channel represents an axis in 3D space, let's say, red for X, green for Y, and blue for Z. We take the noise image and generate a normal map for it on the CPU side. The implementation is as follows. We take a pixel on the image, check its pixels to the left and right. Based on the height difference between these pixels, we know if we have a slope. Then, we do the same thing vertically. After determining the horizontal and vertical slope, we store this information into another texture in the form of RGB channels, and we do it for all pixels. This results in a colored image that says which direction the surface is facing. Have in mind that this is actually not a 100% accurate method to determine surface direction, but it's accurate enough for now. The algorithm seemed correct, but I was always getting rainbows instead of correct normals when I was debugging the normals. I had no idea why this was happening. It took me almost a week to debug this, and I was starting to lose my mind. In the end, 
I found some information on rainbows online and understood that something must be wrong with my texture memory layout. These repeating patterns usually mean one thing when it comes to rendering. It probably means that you're reading memory from places where you shouldn't be reading it. And yep, that was right. I used an RGB color without transparency with the size of 24 bits per pixel, but the GPU understood the image as with transparency that is 32 bits per pixel. Therefore, accessing incorrect data and setting the normals to be like rainbows. After changing the image to use the 32-bit color, I finally saw it. An actual, deformed and decently lit plane that at the very least resembles hills and valleys. I was feeling very happy at this moment. The normal algorithm worked fine, so let's try increasing the size of the terrain and pass a larger noise texture. Oh yes, it actually works. It does look a bit ugly though, because of how dense the noise is. From here on, we can do a lot more stuff with it, like using a smaller noise texture so that the deformities are smoother, like this. There are a ton of parameters we could meddle with to change the result, but I think that is enough playing around for now. Next, I would like to apply actual textures to the terrain, maybe based on height and steepness. And we could possibly try implementing some tools that would allow us to shape the terrain ourselves instead of using a noise matrix. We would likely need some sort of an input system for that, but all that next time. This video is already more than two months in the making, and I am very happy to be finally releasing it. I learned a lot of stuff this time, like switching shaders, using image samplers, creating and using textures, and in general a lot of things about game engine and even GPU architecture, not even mentioning everything about terrain. A lot of things to create a deformed plane, but it was definitely worth it. Alright, to the absolute beast still watching the video, thank you. If you want to support me, be sure to subscribe. Hopefully you enjoyed the video and maybe even learned something new. I'll catch you later. Bye!